Good evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Anne Reesom. And I'm Britton Clenet. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Macau Court sentences tycoons Joseph Lau and Stephen Lowe to more than five years in jail for corruption. Six dead in knife attack blamed on quarrelling street hawkers from Xinjiang in central Chinese market. Search for missing Malaysian plane shifts west amid new reports that it may have been diverted deliberately. A court in Macau has sentenced Hong Kong tycoons Joseph Lau and Stephen Lowe to five years and three months in jail over their involvement in Macau's biggest corruption scandal. Both of them were missing from court for the verdict and the Macau government is powerless to have them extradited to serve out their sentences. ATV's Emily Sue reports. Tycoon Joseph Lau was nowhere to be seen at Macau's court of first instance this afternoon as he sent his girlfriend Yvonne Lai to hear the verdict. Escorted by bodyguards and representatives from the Hong Kong billionaire's Chinese estates holdings, Lai made her way through a media scrum. Businessman Stephen Lowe also did not show up today to face the music. Both he and Lau were found guilty of being involved in Macau's biggest corruption scandal to date. The court found they paid $20 million in bribes to former public works minister Al Man Long to secure a site near Macau's international airport for the La Scala luxury housing development. I was serving a 29-year jail sentence while the Macau government has confiscated the land. Judge Mario Silvestre said investigators' findings in Al's homes and office confirmed that the disgraced former minister had abused his powers to grant Lao the plot without a public tender process. As for Lo, the judge said although he only acted as a middle agent between Lao and the minister, he did set up a company to help finalize the deal. Considering the severity of the crime, along with their attitude throughout the six-month trial, Sylvester decided to sentence the pair to five years and three months in prison on one count of bribe-taking and one count of money laundering. Lawyers for the two vowed to appeal against the verdict. We were not able to understand exactly the grounds of the decision. We will study the decision now and we will appeal uh, within the, the 20 days that we have. Mr. Lau stresses against that he has not committed any improper acts. We are very surprised that uh, with this judgment, uh, because uh, we believe that there was uh, not enough evidence to draw these conclusions and uh, from the, the evidence produced in court there uh, it, is, uh, it is obvious that uh, Mr. Law didn't get any uh, benefit from uh, the uh, facts that uh, were attributed to him and Mr. Law's name never appeared in any uh, um, document mentioned by Mr. Alman Long According to Macau laws, once the pair file an appeal, their sentence will have to be suspended. But the pair have nothing to worry about anyway, even if Macau's top court rejects their appeal. The Macau government is powerless to execute the sentence because it has no extradition agreement with Hong Kong. Both Lao and Lo are off the hook as long as they don't step foot on Macau soil for the rest of their lives. In fact, that's what Lau did throughout the trial, citing health problems, although he was regularly seen dining at his favorite restaurant in Wan Chai. Emily Su, ATV News. At least six people are dead after a knife rampage blamed on quarreling street hawkers at a market in central China's Hunan province. The hawkers are said to be from the troubled Xinjiang region, where separatists have been blamed for a spate of terror attacks. Scores of police officers descended onto a market at Wujialeng district in the central city of Changsha just after 10 this morning. Footage captured by locals with their mobile phones showed the aftermath of the deadly attack in Hunan province. The official Xinhua news agency first reported that a group of knife-wielding men had attacked civilians, raising fears of another terror attack, like the one blamed on Xinjiang separatists in Kunming two weeks ago. The report was corrected later. According to the official version now, the violence was sparked by an altercation between two non-local bread vendors. One of the men pulled out a knife and hacked the other to death. As he fled, the man attacked four other passers-by before he was shot dead by police. Two of the injured died at the scene, while the remaining two were later certified dead in hospital. 
Photos from Sina Weibo, China's equivalent to Twitter, showed a suspect being taken away by police. Local media said a second suspect was arrested and more are still on the run, although none of the reports specified how they were involved. Names released in a Xinhua statement resembled those of ethnic Uyghurs from China's troubled Xinjiang region but the possibility of a terrorist attack was ruled out by local police. A stream of reports and photos flooded blogs and forums on the internet after the incident, but most were quickly removed. The violence comes just two weeks after a far deadlier stabbing spree at a train station in Kunming, which left 29 people dead and 140 injured. That incident came on the eve of the annual parliamentary session in Beijing, where China's leaders met to discuss a wide range of topics on the country's development. Beijing blamed the attack on separatists from Xinjiang, home to a large Uyghur minority, which has a history of discord with Chinese authorities regarding its culture and religion. LegCo President Sang Yuk Singh is urging the Pan Democrats not to boycott the central government's invitation for all 70 lawmakers to visit Shanghai next month. Sang says Beijing's liaison office will help with home return permits for those who don't have them, but some are still planning to snub the offer. On Wednesday, Chief Executive Lan Chenying announced that the central government had given the green light to his proposal for all 70 lawmakers to visit Shanghai on the 12th and 13th of April. The problem is several pan-democrats are planning to boycott the trip as they've been blacklisted by Beijing and had their home return permits confiscated. LegCo President Sung Yok Sing, who will lead the delegation to Shanghai, said today that he had raised the permit issue with the central government. The uh, liaison office has always been very positive um, uh, in response to the chief executive and uh, my uh, request for reconsidering uh, uh, the withholding of, um, of, 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 of these um, documents from some of my colleagues in the, in the legislature. Tsang called on his colleagues not to pass up the chance to talk to mainland officials from the provincial to the top levels of government by joining the trip. As for the matter of their home return permits... We all understand that um, uh, what is involved here is a rather complicated policy, uh, policy issue. So, um, unfortunately, um, the, the problem has not been resolved in time for the upcoming visit. Democratic Party Chairwoman Emily Lau has already turned down the invitation, while others have threatened to boycott the trip unless it gives them a real chance to discuss their concerns about political reform. All we heard are remarks that universal suffrage would not be attainable. What's going to happen is Beijing's going to handpick a few candidates and then let Hong Kong people choose. This is ridiculous. We are furious. The Hong Kong people are furious. So in the midst of this, they suddenly say, oh, you are invited to go to Shanghai. And we say, what for? What are we going to do? So, I mean, we will not just go like that. The chief executive said on Wednesday that details of the tour, including where they would visit, who they would meet, and what would be discussed, would be worked out by the central government as soon as possible. Well, we don't know what's going to happen on that trip. There's no itinerary, no agenda of meetings. We don't know what would be discussed and what officials will meet the delegation. This is ridiculous. If the Beijing officials want to have dialogue with the pan-democrats, there is no need to go to Shanghai. We are all here. Even if they want to come and meet with us this very afternoon or tomorrow, we will do so. It's not as if we want to boycott them. But we do not want to become pieces of ornament in a visit to Shanghai. The pan-democrats are planning to meet the LegCo president on Tuesday for more details. Chief Secretary Carrie Lam today also called on the legislators not to miss a rare opportunity to meet senior mainland officials face to face. She said the invitation was a sign that Beijing was willing to listen to the pan-democrats' views on constitutional reform. The offer comes four years after 42 out of 60 lawmakers, including some pan-democrats, attended the Shanghai Expo in 2010. And in September 2005, 59 out of 60 lawmakers visited the Pearl River Delta in a trip organized by Donald Zhang, who was chief executive at the time. 
Both visits took place at a critical time when Hong Kong was discussing political reform. In other local news, police are investigating the discovery of a premature baby's body in a public hospital toilet in Wan Chai this morning. And all nine suspects arrested locally in connection with last month's knife attack on former Ming Pao chief editor Kevin Lau have been released on bail. ATV's Arthur Akiola reports. The woman and eight men arrested this week for their alleged involvement in the knife attack on Ming Pao newspaper's former chief editor Kevin Lau were let out on bail today. The suspects aged 30 to 57 were arrested in Hong Kong, while the two suspected hitmen who carried out the attack were detained in the mainland city of Dongguan on Sunday. There's no extradition agreement between the two sides, but the SER government is hoping to get them back here to face trial. Police are investigating the discovery of the body of a prematurely born baby in a female toilet on the ground floor of Rutenji Hospital. A cleaner who was called in to clear a blocked toilet in the Accident and Emergency Department made the discovery in Wan Chai shortly after 10.30 this morning. Nearly all of the city's teenagers do not get enough sleep, according to a poll by Chinese University. To mark World Sleep Day, it surveyed more than 4,500 adolescents and found 95% failed to sleep for the recommended nine hours a day. Researchers warned that aside from affecting attention spans and memory, a lack of sleep for young people can have long-term health effects. Those sleeping uh, less than seven hours, they've got a higher blood pressure. Now obviously as a child or even a teenager, if your blood pressure is on the high side, that's not good for you. You are at a high chance of developing hypertension as an adult. And you are also at a higher chance of getting all sorts of metabolic problems. The researchers also warned against catching up on sleep on weekends, as this will make it difficult to adjust to normal sleeping hours during the week. Arthur Akiola, ATV News. The search for missing Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 has shifted to waters around India based on claims the aircraft may have flown longer and farther than previously thought. According to Reuters news agency, the investigation is now focusing on possible foul play as radar tracking evidence suggests the plane was deliberately flown west. Rescuers have so far failed to find any trace of Malaysia Airlines flight MH370, which vanished last Saturday with 239 people on board. The plane, which was flying from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing, last made contact with air traffic control over the South China Sea to the east of Malaysia. After searching the sea between Malaysia and Vietnam, the plane's last confirmed location, efforts are now expanding west into the vastness of the Indian Ocean. The Indian Navy, Air Force and Coast Guard are also now assisting after a request for help from the Malaysian government. According to Reuters news agency, the investigation is now focusing more on a suspicion the flight was deliberately diverted, as radar evidence suggests it was last headed across the Malay Peninsula towards the Andaman Islands. We are actually searching that part of the, uh, of the uh, uh, geography, but uh, the likelihood of the aircraft being there is probably very, very low. An unidentified aircraft that investigators believe was flight MH370 was following a route between navigational waypoints, indicating it was being flown by someone with aviation training when it was last plotted on military radar off the country's northwest coast. The last plot on the military radar's tracking suggested the plane was flying toward India's Andaman Islands, a chain of isles between the Andaman Sea and the Bay of Bengal, officials said. Investigators also said satellites picked up faint signals from the plane up to five hours after its apparent disappearance. The signals led searchers to believe the plane could have flown more than 1,600 kilometers beyond its last confirmed radar sighting. But the new information about the signals has shed little light on the mystery of what happened to the plane, whether it was a technical failure, a hijacking, or another kind of incident on board. Development Minister Paul Chan has dismissed concerns about the state of the property market after a government site in Taipo failed to attract bids meeting the reserve price. Chan is insisting it's not in the public interest to sell land too cheaply. Arthur Kiona reports. A luxury site in Taipo's Pak Shek Kok became the first plot of government land in three and a half years that failed to attract bids meeting the reserve price that would have triggered a sale. 
On Wednesday, the government withdrew tendering for the 19,000 square meter site on Fo Chun Road, facing the Tolo Harbor, after all seven bids by developers fell short. There are five more sites in the district slated for sale. The minister in charge took to the airwaves today to address concerns that this indicates developers are deliberately holding back. Development Secretary Paul Chan insisted the reserve price set for the site was conservative, but that it was not fixed as there was a mechanism in place to adjust the level based on market rates. Chan pointed out that at the same time another site in Sai Kung had sold for a good price. So it would be difficult to draw conclusions based on one plot failing to attract strong bids. But the development chief stressed it would not be in the public interest for the government to sell off land too cheaply, as it is a valuable asset. He's also confident the withdrawal of the site will not affect the government's target of building 470,000 flats in the next decade. The minister is in an uncomfortable position after having recently chastised the MTRC for failing to tender out two above-station property projects. He's threatened to take away the railway firm's property development rights, but now his own department is looking at a similar failure. Arthur Rakiola, ATV News. Overseas again, the U.S. and Russia are holding last-minute crisis talks ahead of this weekend's referendum in Crimea that could see the Ukrainian region make a bid for independence. The latest clashes at rival rallies in the region have led to at least one death. Better Rock reports. Pro- and anti-Russia protesters clashed in the Crimean city of Donetsk overnight. In the worst violence seen in the city so far, protesters were seen throwing grenades at each other. The city is tense as it prepares to take part in Sunday's referendum, in which Crimeans will choose whether they still want to be part of Ukraine after the government was ousted by pro-West politicians. With the threat of IMF austerity measures looming over the country, many Crimeans would rather pick Russia over the punishing economic cuts millions of Europeans are having to endure. The man who signed the deal with the IMF days after being in power, Ukraine's interim prime minister, Arsny Yatsenyuk, has declared the vote unconstitutional and has taken the issue, plus the matter of Russia boosting its forces in Crimea, to the United Nations. This aggression has no reasons and no grounds. This is absolutely and entirely unacceptable in the 21st century to resolve any kind of conflict with tanks, artillery and boots on the ground. Russian Federation has violated a number of bilateral and multilateral treaties that were signed between Ukraine and Russia. But Russia, which believes the ousting of Ukraine's democratically elected leader, Viktor Yanukovych, was just as unconstitutional, dismissed the idea that it was the root of the problems. Russia didn't start the spiral of violence, which over these last few months has determined the development of Ukraine, said Moscow's ambassador to the UN, Vitaly Cherkin. He accused Yatsenyuk of painting an unrealistically idyllic picture of Ukraine, where people would have led long and happy lives if it hadn't been for the intervention by evil Russia. The U.S., which has spent billions of dollars over the years funding pro-Western political groups like Yatsenyuk's Fatherland Party, is standing by its man. We are at a critical moment, as you heard from all council members. The way forward is clear. Russian forces must return to their bases. International human rights monitors must be allowed into Crimea. And all countries must respect Ukraine's territorial integrity. The U.S. and its NATO allies are holding military drills near Russia's border as if to back up threats of sanctions or more if Moscow doesn't fall in line. Ben O'Rourke, KTV News. Time now for sports with Raymond Young. What's been happening at the tennis in California?